Good afternoon. I'd like to say hello and welcome to the latest presentation in the National Consortium of uh, Telehealth Centers webinar series. Uh, today we have an excellent webinar for you. It's Telehealth Implementation, a guide and case study for critical access hospitals. I'm Nikki Parisho, I'm the Program Director for the NRTRC. Um, these webinars are designed to provide you timely information and demonstrations to support and guide the development of your telehealth programs. These webinars are presented on the third Wednesday of every month. We, the NCTRC is HRSA funded. Uh, we are part of 12 regional telehealth resource centers and two national. As I mentioned, uh, we're the Northwest Regional, so we serve that blue upper left-hand corner of the United States. Uh, there are 11 other regional uh, TRCs that are represented by color in their geographic region. We also have two national centers that serve on policy and technology. Um, they each serve as focal points for advancing the effective use of, the tele of telehealth and supporting access to telehealth services in rural and underserved communities. A few housekeeping tips before we get started. Um, your phone and or computer microphone and video has been muted. Um, if for some reason we don't answer your question today, please contact your regional telehealth resource center. Um, please fill out the post webinar survey that helps us identify the needs and, and topics you want further discussion on. Closed captioning is available today. Please submit your questions during the session using the Q&A function. We do have staff to be answering those as we go. This webinar is being recorded and our, the recordings will be posted to our YouTube channel at the site here. So today's webinar is Telehealth Implementation, a review of a guide and case study for critical access hospitals. Uh, we have three speakers today. We have Tori Leach. She's the Medicare Rural Hospital Flex Program Coordinator with uh, HRSA's Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Uh, in her role, she oversees 45 cooperative agreements to state partners, which support uh, 1,350 critical access hospitals nationwide in quality improvement, quality reporting, performance improvement, and benchmarking to assist facilities seeking destination, or I'm sorry, designation as critical access hospitals, and to create a program to establish or expand the provision of rural emergency medical services. She also serves as a program coordinator for the Technical Assistance and Service Center, otherwise known as a TASC, um, which was a co cooperative agreement with the National Rural Health Resource Center. Center. She provides information, tools, and education to cause and individual state flex programs. She's a return Peace Corps volunteer. She's graduated from Union College with a degree in health systems, biology, religious studies. She's currently a healthcare MBA candidate at George Washington University. Thank you for joining us today, Tori. We also have uh, Trudy Bearden. Trudy Bearden, she has served as a senior consultant for Comagin Health since 2010, leveraging her experience as a clinician in the primary care and inpatient settings to provide consulting and practice facilitation to healthcare organizations across the country and beyond. Ms. Bearden provides technical assistance on a broad range of topics, issues, working with teams to improve quality, safety, and efficiency. She has strong expertise, expertise in telehealth, empanelment, quality improvements, care management, population health, EHR workflow optimization, and change management. Ms. Bearden has led Comagine Health's telehealth rapid response team to enable a rapid pivot to support telehealth and virtual service implementation. She's worked with primary care associations and health center control networks across the country, as well within the North, as well as within the Northwest Regional Telehealth Resource Center, the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center, the University of Utah, the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare, and many others to promote telehealth. And last but not least, we have Tressa Keller. She is the, um, she has worked at Logan Health in Shelby for 10 years. She's born and raised in Shelby, Montana. Um, she attended Montana Tech, where she received her bachelor's as well as her master's certificate in healthcare informatics. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Tori to start us out today. 
Hi, good morning and then good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Tori Leach. I am the FLEX Program Coordinator with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. My role here today will be to provide the FRHP perspective as well as the center perspective on this great resource that we've provided for you all. Next slide, please. As a background to those of you who may be unfamiliar with the FLEX program, it is designated by Section 1820 of the Social Security Act, which asks um, state designated entities, which are the state offices of rural health, to engage in activities related to the planning, implementing of rural healthcare plans and networks, to designate facilities as critical access hospitals and providing support to critical access hospitals for quality improvement, quality reporting, performance improvement, benchmarking, and integrating rural emergency EMS services. As you can see on this slide, we have 45 state flex programs, and those are within states that have critical access hospitals as a designation. Um, you can see the major categories on the left-hand side, which we engage in activities such as quality, financial and operational, population health, rural EMS, and innovative model development. I've also hyperlinked our state flex profiles on the slide here, so you can go in and look up a state if you're interested and see what that program is engaged with. Like I mentioned, this program is primarily to support critical access hospitals. And we um, noticed that the, a huge missing area was this connection to telehealth, especially during the public health emergency where telehealth has been a major source of care in rural areas. We wanted to provide a guide that would help engage critical access hospitals in how to implement telehealth programs within their facility. This would not be done without our partnership with the center, with the National Rural Health Resource Center, um, which has a cooperative agreement with us to provide resources and tools to support critical access hospitals and state flex programs. On the next slide, you will see my contact information, and that is where you can reach me with any questions regarding the state flex program or the National Rural Health Resource Center. I'll now turn it over to Trudy. Judy, I believe so, you're Yes. You'd think by now, right? So today we're, um, we've gone through our introductions. We're going to take a quick sachet through the Critical Access Hospital Telehealth Guide. We're going to open it up for any questions or comments, and then we're going to hear from a Critical Access Hospital about their telehealth implementation. We're gonna talk a little bit about how this whole thing got started, how we developed the content. While we go through this, we want to open it up to any and all feedback. So this is uh, the CA Telehealth Guide 1.0, and we know there's gonna be a 2.0. So we um, really solicit feedback um, heartily. Um, and so please just let us know um, if you come upon errors or missing things, um, you know, just let us know. And uh, in case you haven't had a chance to see it, I'm just going to tap the link to the guide right there. And um, so we'll, we'll take, we'll look at the table of contents. So the guide has a hyperlink table of contents. And it's rather difficult to demo an 88 page guide. So we've pulled out a few topics that we think might be of a high interest and we'll touch on those. We're really happy about a piece that we put together, the billing code table, and we'll show you the telehealth program assessment as well. So it was a partnership. That's what got it started. So the National Rural Health Resource Center or the center had this vision um, based on a need that we really need a critical access hospital guide around telehealth and virtual service delivery during the pandemic and beyond. And they gave the NRTRC and Comagine Health really well articulated expectations and specifications, which was really, really helpful. It's really tough to put together a telehealth guide right now because we have all this public health emergency waivers, et cetera. Um, we know that there's how things are during the public health emergency, and we know how things are going to 
we kind of know how things are going to be after the public health emergency, although some of those details are still murky. There's pending legislation. There's a proposed rule um, in the work. So, you know, we're going to have to update it um, at some point or another. Let's go to the next slide. So we received very clear direction from TASC and the center. And the guide was geared towards practicality and minimizing as much as possible what I always call TBU or true but useless information. So I see a lot of guides that have um, just information that's broadly out there and just really bulks up the content they limited us to no more than 60 pages. And you heard me say that it's 88 pages. It's about 66 pages, um, but then with appendices and so on and so forth, it ends up being about 88 pages long. And it kind of reminds me of a team that I was working with and um, we had a guy that was 30 pages long and my colleagues from Malaysia said, yeah, that's really great You know, if you're having trouble falling asleep. So we really hope that this is not how you feel about an 88 page guide and that you can pick and choose and find the pieces that work for you or make sense to you. It was informed by so many subject matter experts and individuals. And we wanna be clear that this is kind of a starting place. It's not an all inclusive policy guide for telehealth. So the center said, you know, I wanna put that specific verbiage in there. You know, there's just so much and we have the calendar year 2022 physician fee proposed rule and we have submitted comments on it, but in November, you know, things are gonna change and we're gonna have to take a look, see, and maybe make some changes. Let's go to that next slide, Nikki. So we want your feedback. Uh, this is the way that you build skill and expertise is by feedback. So we'd love to hear either now or, you know, when you're trying to fall asleep and you're reading all 88 pages, what's helpful, what's not, is there missing or incorrect information? Are there other resources that really should be? So anything else, we're gonna have a section with Q&A. Um, you can chime in then, you can chat in your thoughts or you can go directly to info at nrtrc.org to let us know. All right, so look at that, we've already knocked out like three out of seven of what we're gonna do. So um, I'm gonna go through the slides that I have, Nikki, really quickly, and then I'm gonna shift to actually looking at the, the guide itself. So let's go to the, to the next uh, slide. So that hyperlink table of contents, that's what it looks like. It's, there's a lot in there, it's chock full. You can see there are tons of topics. Each one is you know as succinct and um, condensed as we can possibly get it. Hold on a second, we're gonna get to it. Um, let's go to the next slide. So um, we do wanna point out that today we are orienting you to some of the resources in the guide and the guide itself, but your regional telehealth resource center has amazing resources. So at one, I don't know, about nine months ago, I, I went to all of the websites of all of the telehealth resource centers so that I could get a sense for who has what and um, how complete things were, how easy it was to navigate around those. And I was just so impressed. All right, Nikki, so if you stop sharing and let me take over control, let's take a peek at the guide. And uh, so if you've attended many telehealth webinars, you'll hear how important it is to actually look at your, at your patient, like look at the light on the camera, but um, like any good clinician, I'm gonna, like if I were looking at a second screen, looking at my EHR, I would let you know. So if you see my eyes over looking over to this, in this direction, it's because this is, um, I'm looking at my second screen. Nikki, will you just confirm for me that you're seeing the guide? Okay, I got a nod. We're seeing Usually it, I have it's, it. It's at the page break, but we are seeing it. There we go. Okay, okay, good. All right. Yeah, usually I have a little green frame around that lets me know I'm screen sharing, but for some reason, Zoom is not showing that. So we're going to um, take a really quick look at telehealth basics. Um, and it's 
really important that when we to know that when we talk about telehealth, telehealth is when we're doing healthcare service delivery, it is defined by the discrete set of codes that Medicare um, allows us to use for telehealth, so to speak. So it's important to know the basics. And there's telehealth as per Medicare with a set of telehealth codes and rules and regulations. There's telehealth according to your state and Medicaid, and that can be very, very different. So Medicare, for example, reimburses critical access hospitals for an originating site fee. But I have had to look up, I think probably half of our states for a variety of reasons to see whether the state Medicaid reimburse a critical access hospital or a rural health clinic on that originating site fee. So it's important to keep straight that Medicare is gonna have certain rules. Your state Medicaid is gonna have certain rules. Medicare may have a huge number of telehealth codes that they reimburse for. Your state Medicaid may have just a select set that they reimburse for. And then there are the private insurers. So for the telehealth basics, we primary fo primarily focus on Medicare, but just know that, for example, see here we have originating site where the patient is and the distant site or distant site hospital, um, what those requirements are. Um, who the providers are, who can deliver telehealth services. That might be very different with your state Medicaid. Consent, consent is very straightforward for Medicare, but each state has their own requirements for consent. I know that there's at least one state in the nation that the state Medicaid doesn't say anything about consent, but most of the states have requirements. They can be really, really simple or they can be really complex. Um, so just know what the case is for your state. Okay, so that's just a really quick sachet through the uh, telehealth basics. And then if you're just starting out, you may look at what those initial steps are. So you might want to conduct a telehealth readiness assessment, which is included in the in the guide and actually takes up about 22 pages of the 88. So it's a, a pretty comprehensive, uh, assessment. But again, we tried to keep the fussy stuff out. So a lot of telehealth readiness assessments will say, have you done a market analysis? And you're going to hear from Tressa. And Tressa's, uh, her critical access hospital's approach to doing market analysis was, oh, to talk to people um, and to find out what their needs were, their actual needs are, uh, kind of boots on the ground in the grocery store and say, what is it that we can provide you for telehealth services for specialists. So reach out and hear what other critical access hospitals have done. So uh, Tressa's hospital started doing telehealth in 2012. Um, I think by now most critical access hospitals and rural health clinics are, have, are doing telehealth, but reach out and hear what other people are doing. Nikki and I have interviewed two critical access hospitals and every time I learn really new and cool stuff. So you know, reach out and find out what other people have done. Don't reinvent the, the wheel. Form a dedicated team. Um, clarify, enumerate, and describe possible telehealth and virtual services um, opportunities. I feel as though critical access hospitals and RHCs have like a tiny set, a subset of what they could be doing. So what are all those telehealth codes that you could be using? And that's one of the resources that we added to this telehealth guide that I think is missing from other telehealth um, guides and toolkits, and we'll show that to you uh, in just a second. You need to know what your broadband is, where you're gonna be um, as an originating site. So if you are gonna set up a, a telehealth hub where patients can come to your critical access hospital and see specialists, you have to have adequate broadband. And whether what the broadband is in your area may not be what broadband is in that exam room that you're going to be using for your originating site for helping patients see their specialists. So just make sure that you know what that the speed is okay and that it can handle both audio and video. So a few additional um, pieces. Um, we try not to keep this too overwhelming. Um, you know, and your internal processes are going to be really important. I talked to a lot of um, safety net clinics, rural health clinics, and FQHCs, and they're really, really worried about budget. And they think, oh my gosh, this is going to be a huge outlay of money. And it 
actually not. Um, we find that you know you have to have broadband. That might be a cost, but as long as you have a device with mic and camera, and you have some way to engage in a telehealth visit, it's not always a huge outlay of money. Um, and staffing ends up not being such a huge, huge deal as well, because what we've heard, especially from the critical access hospitals that we've talked to, is that they end up cross-training staff. You just kind of just make room for telehealth um, and uh, train people. And I think uh, maybe it was Tressa's critical access hospital. They actually had respiratory therapists as part of these telehealth visits. So vendor selection and guidance, um, we like this very... Uh, practical advice that we've put together. There's so much and it's an area where people are very unsure. They wanna make sure they aren't locked into something. They wanna make sure they do their due diligence, but who's gonna do that? How are you gonna do it? So some very practical guidance on how you select your vendor. We talked to one critical access hospital that decided to just go with Zoom. Like they use Zoom for their staff. Staff were familiar with it. Why you know, bring on something new? Some EHRs have really great embedded um, options. Um, some of the state health information exchanges are coming up with telehealth solutions as well. Um, so, you know, here's, here are a few steps. I think we only have about five um, and you'll see that we reference other resources. One of the other things that we wanted to not do was recreate the wheel. So the, the AMA telehealth implementation playbook is really, really great. So why would we redo what they've already done? So in some cases like this, we direct you to work that's already been done um, really, really well. We, we care a lot about person-centered telehealth and um, I think that that really resonates with people somebody heard a webinar that I did called person-centered telehealth and they reached out and wanted me to deliver a, a um, uh, actually it didn't even have anything to do with telehealth but they were so impressed with the fact that we had considered person-centeredness um, we have to be person-centered and it's not just patient-centered telehealth so it's staff as well so if your clinicians are confused and don't have support with telehealth, they're gonna be really frustrated. Even though health equity and barriers and, and solutions is a subset of person-centered telehealth, it is the hugest thing that we're gonna deal with in our rural communities. And I really feel as though we can have person-centered telehealth. I would love to see community-centered telehealth where we have solutions for patients that are embedded in the community. So libraries have telehealth hubs where patients have a private place, they have um, connectivity, they have that private space, a computer, a mic, and, um, uh, uh, and a camera where they can take their call, where our local employers have a private room where employees can. So I think we can have this community-based um, solution. And I think critical access hospitals are so aware of their communities and what's going on with their communities. But does everybody have con connectivity? They don't. What are the solutions? You can have lack of an internet connection or a data plan. So if you wanna take your telehealth visit on your phone, you might be using data and you may not be able to support that. So you might be able to talk for a half an hour and boom, your data plan is over and you get shut off. Um, broadband out of patient's location, lack of uh, to be able to even talk on the phone. So we're gonna be, I think, moving to a lot more audio only options, lack of reliable transportation. So you may have a great setup where a patient can take a visit at the critical access hospital, but how does a patient get there? Um, they don't have a camera or a microphone. Some rural health clinics actually take an iPad to the patient's home so that they can engage in a, a visit. Um, low digital proficiency, and I, I have to say, I like not calling it literacy because if you don't have it, then are you illiterate? So I prefer the term proficiency. Um, and a few other things that you know you should really think about: homelessness, the hearing impaired. So this section on hearing impaired was added by one of our contributors to this document, um, and I was so glad to have that additional input and insight into what's really important when we think about equity. I want to really quickly cover our appendices. This table here is something that we're very proud of. 
because we have not seen anybody else do it for you. And it is, there are four buckets of telehealth codes. There are the category one and the category two codes. And those are kind of like the permanent codes. There are interim codes that are gonna disappear at the end of the public health emergency. And there's a new category called category three and they're gonna be around until December 31st, 2023. So we took kind of the category one and what we call permanent ones and we group them. So instead of telling you, oh, you can look at all of the services, just go to the massive Excel spreadsheet that CMS has posted. We put them in this table and group them so that you could see where, where they are. So hospital, critical care, consult, and nursing facility services, these are telehealth codes that critical access hospitals can use. And even though you won't be billing for them, these are the kind of the national average reimbursement rates. So sure, you may not be able to bill this amount and receive this amount of reimbursement, but if you're gonna talk to specialists about services that they can provide or telehealth into your critical access hospital, knowing what the reimbursement is to make the case for getting those services into your critical access hospital can be really, really helpful. So post-discharge services, sorry, I'm gonna scroll. I hope this doesn't uh, make your eyes bug out. Um, evaluation and management visits. Um, there are a lot of um, behavioral health visits as well, chronic kidney disease, behavioral health and uh, mental health. Um, so we hope that you find this table helpful. Um, I'm not, uh, let's see, I think I'm almost at the bottom of the table. Um, if your eyes aren't glazed over by now. But anyway, check it out um, and see if you can find some opportunities in here to uh, really up your telehealth game at your critical access hospital. We have a whole set of workflows. They're just sample workflows, but when we hear from practices and critical access hospitals and rural health clinics and other organizations, um, you know how with, uh, um, with real estate, you hear location, location, location. Well, with telehealth, it's workflow, workflow, workflow. It's really important. Here's an example of a very busy workflow. And yes, I put this together. I'm a clinician, so it's kind of half telehealth workflow and half clinic protocol. Um, but um, So it's a little bit of overkill, but we have some examples of workflows. And I like to use Visio, but you know what? Post-it notes on a wall um, works for a uh, workflow. It's gonna bounce us back up to the other ones. Here's the telehealth program assessment. Um, it's also posted on the NRTRC website in case you want to have just it and not 88 pages, but 22 pages. And um, bear with me a second while I scroll through. So it's arranged, so there's kind of a maturity model. So are you in level one, level two, level three? And this is, we expect that teams will do this. Um, assessment together and decide where you are. So, you know, are you here? Um, you know, maybe you're in the in the yellow on this one. At the end of the, um, of the assessment, it calculates your score and kind of reminds you again of the maturity model and where you might fall. In a second, let me take a guess at what page that is, that is on. Um, there's a, a bonus section for virtual services. So I work with a lot of FQHCs and rural health clinics and they just are missing several services that they can provide. Um, and that is that leads me to, so we covered the appendices. We took a really quick sachet through some parts of the table of contents. We took a peek at the table. We looked at the appendices, but I wanted to, this, what comes after this section in the assessment are, you know, these additional virtual services. Do you, are you doing virtual communication services, especially at your RHC? Um, are you doing remote physiologic monitoring, et cetera? Are you doing chronic care management and principal care management? And for each of these, we have resources posted on the NRTRC website. Um, this is a document that is goes into the chronic and principal care management services. CMS does have some good um, resources, uh, but you know we have a table in here. I won't 
there's eight pages and I'm not gonna scroll because it drives people a little bit nuts on, on Zoom. Um, but it's a source of healthcare service delivery that's really important. So it's for your high-risk patients. Um, and especially in primary care, we are going to see insurers and CMS and Medicaid more and more requiring that we identify who our high-risk patients are and provide care management services. And so let's just do it now. Um, and starting in 2000, starting in January of this year, our rural health clinics could also do principal care management. Um, I, this is an exciting option for expanding access, optimizing care, and capturing revenue. Um, I do entire workshops on this and webinars, and we have it all condensed in this one resource for you. Interprofessional consults is another underutilized um, option. It's a patient-centered referral option. Um, RHCs and critical access hospitals are not reimbursed for um, these services, but it expands access um, and helps, helps patients not have to drive hours for a consult. So it's an option for, to ask your specialist and say, do you do interprofessional consults? And they will probably say, huh, do we do what? And so you just send them this resource and ask whether they would they could provide these services. Um, these codes and reimbursements have been around for a long, long time, but CMS has not created any, you know how they have those really great MLN booklets or fact sheets? They have not done this for interprofessional consults. And it's like this, you know, nobody knows about it. And so we're really hoping to get the word out. Remote physiologic monitoring, same thing. CMS has not created any um, guidance documents around remote physiologic monitoring. And so here we give you the lowdown. Um, and unfortunately, CMS does not reimburse rural health clinics. However, you can do some of this work under chronic care management. Um, and then if the final rule gets passed the way we think it's going to be passed, we're going to have to go in here and update this because CMS is adding uh, remote um, therapeutic uh, monitoring codes. So we're pretty excited about that because that op opens up another option. Oof. Okay, so I think I've talked about as fast as I possibly can. Um, and I think I have covered all of the information that I said I would. Um, correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think I'm ready to hand things off to um, a Q&A. If people have questions, I see there are a bunch of things in chat and I have not been able to pay attention to them. So if there are questions there, um, maybe we should try to tackle those. So Trudy, we don't have any questions in the Q&A uh, box. We have gotten a lot of feedback and comments um, expressing appreciation and gratitude for the guide in the chat box, but no uh, specific questions that I've seen. So if anybody has questions, they can throw it in now. Uh, but in the interim, we'll hand it over to Tressa from Logan Health of Shelby, Montana, a critical access hospital there to share um, their critical access hospital telehealth story and um, spotlight them and the, the good work that they're doing. Um, and I do see a couple of questions that came in and we will, um, we will get to those in about 10 minutes about um, the interprofessional consult. So Tressa, I'll start sharing the slides and hand it over to you. All right. Thanks, Nikki. I appreciate having you having me on here today. So I'm Tressa Keller. I am fortunate enough to work at Logan Health Shelby. So we are a critical access hospital located in Shelby, Montana. So we're in North Central Montana. We're up near the border. And so I'm going to share from a COD perspective today our journey. So um, go ahead and next slide, please. So we're able to deliver a wide variety of specialty care here in Shelby, Montana via telehealth. And so we've worked to continue to build this um, list of specialty care that we can provide. Actually, last night I was down at the golf course and I was approached by someone saying, hey, my husband and I were just talking that we need a call tomorrow to see, do you guys have this telehealth specialty care where we can have our son come and have telehealth services with you guys versus us traveling across the state. Not only will the kid miss school, but we'll miss um, 
work as well. So it is really truly, like Trudy said, connecting with your community, the fact that you know them and that they know that you're here for them. I think that is a huge um, part that leads to success of a telehealth program. Next slide. So keys to success. There are a lot of different components that go over, go into the overall successful program. The big thing though, is keeping that patient at the forefront of this delivery of healthcare. That is ultimately the most important factor. We want them to be even more impressed with a telehealth visit than they would be in person. We want them to walk away feeling that they received the best care possible in our community. So today I'd like to talk a little bit more about workflow. So how can we help make that visit the best visit possible? So they are critical for success. They make the program. Nine years ago, if you called up to Mariah's Medical Center and you wanted to make a telehealth appointment, you'd probably be transferred to a few people and then you'd probably get the appointment made. You'd show up for the day of your appointment and they'd probably tell you that doctor wasn't here and you'd probably walk away super confused. Our staff would be super confused as well. Today, if you fast forward and I'll, you show up for a telehealth visit or you call us for a telehealth visit, you are being routed to the people you need to talk with. You're being walked up to the registration desk that you need to be at. You're being provided the exact packet that you need. So it just goes to show workflows do make the program a success. Continually, we perform analysis on our workflows. What our workflows were in 2012 are not what they are today. So we wanna make sure that we are involving everyone who's involved in the process. We do not wanna leave anyone out when we're doing workflow analysis. What are the providers experiencing? What is the patient experiencing? What are our staff experiencing? And it's not just in the visit, it's from scheduling to registration, to the actual appointment, to discharging the patient, to follow up with the patient. So those are the care components, but you also have the operational ones. Do we have the contracts in place? Do we have the credentialing in place? Do we have billing and coding? It takes all different parts to make the overall workflow work. Plus, we want to make sure that we're working with those individuals who are boots on the ground. Like Trudy mentioned, it is definitely important to have them involved to make this a success. So overall, we make sure that we also document the changes. And so did something change? What changed? Who is responsible for implementing that change as well as communicating that change out? So with that, the education and engagement of the facility we have seen definitely grow. They know that there is a binder down at the nurse's station that has the different packets available for the different specialties and the different sites. They know within there too that it's going to tell you exactly who to contact and what workflow to use. It is wonderful to know that anyone could honestly pick that up and run with it and be a telepresenter for the day. We utilize RT, we utilize nursing staff. Um, it's a wide variety to take it. Um, that make it work. So definitely, it is definitely important to document those changes too, so you can look back and see what worked and what didn't work, and staff know what to expect. Overall, we also want to maintain a level of standardization. We want to make sure that while we're delivering these services, that it is consistent. That way, the patient and providers know at all times what to expect. Also, that provides some guidelines for our staff to make sure that the workflow is appropriate. We want to make sure, like Trudy showed, there's a lot of different guidelines that we're following those at all times. Uh, so, for example, the importance of standardization and education and engagement of the facility, there was a potential stroke patient that arrived in our ER. The staff knew that we had the service. The staff knew to grab the packet. They knew to follow the workflow that is just right on the machine. Um, so that way, that patient in our ER in Shelby, Montana, could be connected with a neurologist and receive the treatment that they needed, and there was not a time delay. They did not have to be um, flown out or anything like that just to see the neurologist. That time delay would have impacted that patient's outcome. It is amazing to see these outcomes of our community members where our staff made an impact by knowing our workflows and we had telehealth in place. So it's wonderful to utilize health, telehealth to provide care locally. A reminder also, technology and resources change. Like this is a great resource that Trudy and Nikki and the team have put together. Use those resources, learn from others. Having conversations makes 
it fun too. Cause you're like, what are you doing there? I can learn from you. I can share with you. So use it to your advantage. So overall, the workflows definitely are important and share, communicate. You never know what you can gain from someone. Next slide, please. So collaboration and communication. We need the providers and the community on board. It is definitely important that we have their engagement and buy-in. Back in 2012, they would have been like, I don't know about that. It's like, I'll just, I'll drive six hours to go see that patient or to see that provider. Now they're like, I'll come across town. It literally takes less than a minute to get across town. So they would love to come to our facility. Not only does that reduce their time and expenses, but it helps with the continuity of care. That means we have that record too right here and they can do their follow-up care. So without their engagement of the providers too, it wouldn't be possible. So we are very excited that we have several great partners who are always willing and open to the different ideas that we have. So it's wonderful that we have people asking for it too. Our staff also, they are aware to ask if they have a patient that they're interacting with that is receiving care outside. Can we do this? How can we make this happen? Also engage with your community. There's a lot of different entities, I imagine, in everyone's communities. Reach out. You don't know what they might have as a need for their business, but also for their staff members. They might know that they're having someone travel and miss work or that it's becoming a financial burden. There's a lot of different things. So we've utilized telehealth, um, our uh, different health fairs, a virtual health fair. We put it out on our Facebook. We really want the community to know about it as well. Um, also different healthcare facilities, even law enforcement. There's a lot of different opportunities with them as well. So reach out to other entities um, and also keep an eye on regulations. You never know what opportunities might be coming with regulation changes. Um, so they definitely are improving for telehealth and we look forward to them continuing to improve. I also feel as a critical access hospital, it's part of our responsibility to reach out to uh, Nikki and our different resources to say, hey, this isn't working or we're running up against this issue because if we don't communicate with them that we have a barrier, they can't help us and they really are a great resource. So we do have barriers. We've overcome a lot of barriers, but we still have some that we continue to work through. So telehealth has truly come a long way over the years and it's an exciting component to the delivery of healthcare. Next slide. So lastly, there's a lot of opportunities. We are so fortunate, like I said, to have a great facility that supports the program, partners and other entities, as well as a community that supports this program. Our ultimate mission though, is to support the delivery of healthcare for patients and providers. We truly wanna keep that patient at the forefront of it because they are our community members. They're our family members, our neighbors, and that is how we thrive as a critical access hospital. So it's a continual process to promote and engage to make sure that our programs are continuing to improve. And I feel that once you get that momentum going as a critical access hospital and working on your workflows, it'll come naturally and it's really exciting. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Tressa. And I do want to share that um, there, there will be a written up spotlight that will go out with the, um, with the slides, I did see in the chat, there was a request for the, the slides from this presentation. So those will be going out along with um, the, the spotlight on Logan Health Shelby and their telehealth program. So, and that will be up on the NRTRC website as well. So at this time, I would like to take a minute. I did see some questions come in through um, the Q&A. So the first one is from um, Marluz Martinez. Uh, do the interprofessional consultations apply to telebehavior health consultations? Um, Judy, I don't know if you want to share the interprofessional consultation resource again. I can stop sharing. Or if you want to take that one. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so I um, responded in chat as well. Um, they can apply to any type of consult. It's not um, it's not limited to behavioral health or medical conditions, but it's, you know, it's, uh, so 
CMS says these consults are typically initiated by a primary care provider to a specialist for a low acuity condition specific question that can be answered without an in person visit. So if that is a mental health low acuity condition specific specific question that would still work. Um, this is the other thing that it specifies so. The consultant can do this for new or established patients, new or existing problem that is exacerbated. They have some documentation requirements as well. Um, there are some frequency limits, of course. Um, and it does say that, let's see, just to be really clear here, this um, it's so they can provide the report either electronically or verbally. Um, but it's not with the patient being seen. So if you have a question, like say you have um, somebody with schizophrenia and you have an antipsychotic uh, medication or medication change, or you need to up it, or you need to add a medication. If you have a specialist who will engage with you in this way, this might be an appropriate way to do that for a behavioral health question. Note that, um, if you are the person who is doing the referring, um, there's only one code that you can use. So it's the 99452. And it is, um, it's, there's not a lot of reimbursement. So you spend 16 minutes or more kind of putting things together to send to the consultant. The reimbursement is only $37 or the Medicare allowed charge. Um, but it's really the consultant who has these other codes for billing. And so if they do like a really short quickie and they respond by internet and they do, you know, an EHR assessment, their reimbursement is small, but you can see in the codes above like the 99446, it's only $19, but if they spend a half hour or more, it's $73 reimbursement. And Honestly, if they have to do research and review records and so on and so forth, they're going to be headed into the $73 reimbursement range. Um, and not all consultants are going to do this. So would they like to get $73 for half hour of looking over reports? Or would they like to get the patient into the office and have a face-to-face -face, um, and charge a higher code? So, you know, I think there's potential for these, but it has to be the right specialist um, for the right condition. Okay, I probably over answered that question, but there you have it. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, and while you have that pulled up, I think you could go over to the reimbursement table. The next question is, can you clarify more regarding what services are reimbursed for critical access hospitals? Right, so critical access hospitals and uh, rural health clinics can act as an originating site. So you can have um, so that's where the patient is. So the critical access hospital or the rural health clinic can be the originating site. And you can have any number of people delivering telehealth services to you. Um, it doesn't, it's not limited. Any of the telehealth codes, whoever is delivering it, they're gonna bill those codes. The critical access hospital or RHC, depending on the insurance of the patient can bill that originating site fee. Um, I know this is a little bit removed from what the actual question is. But here at Comagine Health, we're the CMS designated quality improvement organization for six states. And back in April of 2020, we ran a billing report and we saw that one rural health clinic in one year had captured $20,000 billing originating site fees. So they were really busy with their telehealth. Um, there are two situations. So here you'll see there are two situations in which an institutional facility may bill for distant site services. So that's, you know, the, um, the originating site fee, um, you bill the Q3014 and the reimbursement, um, even over the years, it, CMS kind of increases the amount little by little, um, we're still only at like $27 per originating site fee reimbursement. So for the distant site services, yes, the critical access hospital can um, if you, if you have one of those two situations, the entire suite of telehealth codes are available to the critical access hospital. So there are, I think, uh, a little over a hundred category one and two codes, so the permanent codes. 
I think there are 135 interim codes. And then there's, I don't even know how many of the category three codes are, but there are a lot of telehealth codes. So if you, the facility is a critical access hospital that elected the method two payment option um, with the practitioner who is delivering the services, reassigning their benefits to the critical access hospital, or when the facility provides uh, medical nutrition therapy services, which um, I can't remember how many codes there are for MNT, but the reimbursement is not huge. So I think if you don't know what your case is at your critical access hospital, I would, I would see whether you have this option and then you're looking at being able to deliver distance site services. And if you are a rural health clinic during the waivers until the public health emergency ends, the rural health clinics have that whole suite of telehealth codes where they can be delivering that telehealth. So, you know, their reimbursement is going to be, you know, around $95, but they can be delivering any of those telehealth services. And I've lost count of how many pending legislative bills there are to make rural health clinics and FQHCs permanent distant site sites and lifted geographic uh, requirements. So um, probably a little bit of an over answer on that one too. So forgive me for both of those, but if, if per chance you still have questions left um, surrounding that, um, please let me know. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, if you'd stop sharing your screen, I'll pull up the, um, the closing slides here. Um, if anybody has any other questions, feel free to throw them in as I review um, the upcoming webinar from the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers. Um, so again, uh, they occur the third Thursday of every month, which is today. Uh, the next topic is to be determined. It will be hosted by the Southwest Telehealth Resource Center. And that date is slated for October 21st, 2021. Hard to believe October 21st is next month um, from 11 to noon Pacific time. So again, please check the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers website for more information on the upcoming webinar. Uh, these slides along with the Logan Health of Shelby Telehealth Spotlight will be coming to you via email. You can also find them on the NCTRC website and the NRTRC website. Um, and I just want to ask everybody to please complete the survey um, that will open after this webinar. It is important to get your feedback uh, so we know where we can improve. Um, I just want to check, I see a new Q&A popped up. Um, post the link to the guide again. Yep, we will put that in chat right now to the critical access hospital guide. And I just wanna thank you all. And for the clinicians and healthcare providers out there in the group, thank you for all the hard work you're doing and um, everybody stay safe.